Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. Anyone who has been through it will tell you that cancer treatment is not easy. Chemo and radiation can make you sick and exhausted. And that is why a growing number of cancer doctors are practicing what is being called common sense oncology, weighing the pros and cons of certain treatments against a patient's quality of life. We'll hear from a doctor championing this approach in a few minutes, but first, I'm joined by Alicia Mafflin. She has stage four ovarian cancer and she is with me in our Toronto studio. Alicia, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Nice to see you. Nice to see you and thank you for being here. My pleasure. Um, This is a a tricky conversation and a tricky question for the very beginning of the conversation. Mm. Do you remember the moment of your diagnosis? It's a moment I'll never forget, actually. I had... uh, been sent to the ER because my left leg had swollen up and they ran some tests on me and they asked me to call a loved one, which seemed quite odd. And um, upon my husband's arrival, they told us that I had cancer pretty much all over my body, in my bones, in my ovaries, um, in my lymphatic system, in my stomach, and that they would be referring me to uh, Princess Margaret. The cancer center in the Toronto. The cancer center, yeah. When was this? This was June 2020, 22. Um, I was shocked and devastated. And also I had this feeling as though everything that had happened in my life up until that point was before, you know? There's like a very clear a very line, clear like a cleavage line. between this yeah. and that. that. That was gone. And everything after my diagnosis was potentially my last after, right? Our life is consists of befores and afters, and that felt like this was going to be my last after. Do you mind me asking how old you were when you got the diagnosis? Sure. I was just doing the math, 43. 43. <laughs> yeah. And so as a 43-year-old, given mm-hmm. that, with that delineation between then and now, they refer you to one of the best cancer hospitals in the country. Yes. <clears throat> and the point of that is we're going to take this on. We're going to try to figure out a, they, a as they say, a path forward, yeah. right? Yeah. What were the treatments that you went through? So I did um, first four rounds of chemo, and then I did a total abdominal hysterectomy and a partial omentectomy, which is where they take a part of your um, the lining of your stomach. And this is uh, like a debulking surgery. So the initial chemo is to reduce as much cancer as there is in the body, and then the surgery to remove it. And then I did an additional three rounds of chemo. At that point, I went into remission for about three months, and then we discovered the cancer had come back. And then shortly thereafter, I started experiencing incredible pain in my head and my neck. And so I had urgent radiation for five days straight, and then... That's been mostly it since then. <laughs> and that was in July of That's 2023. That's a lot. Perhaps too much, <laughs> not just a lot, but for a while I kept saying this is a lot. And then after that, I started saying this is too much. For somebody, and I'm sorry for what mm-hmm. you went through, because that's awful. Um, Thank you. For somebody who has never gone through something like chemotherapy, mm-hmm. can you describe what it feels like when, when it feels like it's too much? When it feels like I know what I'm doing and I know why I'm doing this, Mm. but I don't know, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I think what happens initially is that you kind of rally and you you get on this moving train and you're doing your treatments and you're going to the, the doctor's office and you're getting blood work and you're kind of just going through the steps one foot in front of the other. And then eventually that starts to compound and it feels as though your life is giving me giving you more than you could possibly take. And I remember feeling after the radiation that I couldn't do this anymore. Physically, where mm-hmm. were you? I mean, what, like, what, where, did, what, what, where were you at? What did you feel like at that point? So I think what's interesting about these treatments and, and is that when you're receiving them, they don't hurt. They're quiet. They're painless. And then within a day or so, you feel like you've been in a car accident that you can't remember, like a really bad car accident. And your body is aching and you feel a kind of exhaustion that you didn't even think was possible. Like you can't even imagine that 
you did things before, you <laughs> like walking the dog or walking to get the mail or, you know, going out to dinner or th- just the normal things that we do in our everyday lives, all of that disappears because you feel like I can't even get off this couch. How active were you in that before time? Mm-hmm. I mean, what was life like before that visit to the ER? Uh, it was very active. I, I traveled quite a bit. I, I taught yoga. I went for long walks. I live in the country, so I'd go for long walks with my dog. I was a very active person. Um, I enjoyed uh, experiences and spending time in my body, using my body a lot. You know, that that's what my life was, and it felt so good. <laughs> and then suddenly that disappears, and you're just you're left trying to renegotiate your relationship with your body and trying to understand your body again and trying to reestablish a connection that feels so broken and possibly even betrayed. Is that what it, I was going to say? Is that what it felt like? That, that yeah. the body has kind of let you down in some way? Well, no, I'm not saying that my body has let me down. I just, I felt as though that you have to almost detach from your body to get through what it's going through. In a lot of ways, I felt like my mind and my emotions had kind of abandoned my body and left it on its own through mm-hmm. the experience because there's so much pain, there's so many needles, there's so much um, ache, and it just feels like a body that's no no longer yours, and you kind of separate from it. You kind then, of, when you were talking about that, you just closed your eyes, and you, as you were describing it too, it's like you were taking yourself out of that moment. Again. Yeah, I mean, you, I think you disassociate a little yeah. <laughs> um, just to get through it. And then after that sort of session, all of those sessions are all done and you're, you finally have this quiet moment of, oh, you're in remission or you have a break, you kind of realize that you don't know your body anymore and you have to find a way to connect again and find a way to accept it again and find a way to love it again. And it's really hard. You made a decision um, mm-hmm. to stop yes. that treatment, to stop chemotherapy and radiation. Yeah. Why did you do that? So my radiation, my last radiation was, my last and only radiation was in July of 2023. And towards the end of 2023, I started to experience a lot of pain in my body. And, you know, the supportive care team at Princess Margaret uh, gave me a protocol um, of different types of medications to, to help with the pain. And then it just felt like the pain was starting to be too much. So I returned to my oncologist and she made the recommendation that I um, try chemo one more time, a uh, less toxic version. Uh, they say a palliative type of chemo to manage the pain. And so I did chemo one last time just in February of this year, 2024, and I feel like as though I knew very quickly that I was never going to do it again. <laughs> My body did not respond well, and it was—it actually responded worse than it had those first seven times, and even to the radiation. And I don't know if it was just the trauma of knowing what I was put, about to put it through again, but I decided very quickly that I was never going to do this again and that I just wanted to live my life. I did not want to be in and out of the hospital again. I did not want the rise and fall of treatment, recovery, and then, you know, a week or so of feeling better and then going back into it again. Because the rest of me is healthy. The rest of me feels good. And I didn't want to, for lack of a better word, destroy that. What what were you told by, by the oncologists and by the doctors around you, the other doctors around you, about how long, if you were to continue doing that, Mm -hmm. how long that might prolong life? That there's a there's a consequence, but it's you know short term pain for long term gain. If I can yeah. Put it that way. So at this point in my diagnosis, we're not um, we're not talking about prolonging life per se. We're just talking quality of life. And this type of chemo was really just about me being able to get through my everyday life without pain. What I have found since stopping uh, that chemo and choosing more lifestyle approaches is that I feel better. And I don't know that that would be everyone's experience, but for me, uh, I feel better without it. And my oncologist has been so incredible. Uh, Dr. Sarah Ferguson has always made it my choice, always created space for me to feel empowered in this journey. 
And certainly when I came back to her and said, you know, I don't want to do this anymore, she said, I remember specifically, right, you're going to live your life. And I felt so grateful that it didn't have to become a discussion or anything I'd have to defend. Um, and so I see her, I'm going to be seeing her every three months to check in unless there's acute symptoms. Yeah. What were the, and I don't want to pry, um, but... You can pry. It's well, okay, Matt. <laughs> you, you would have to talk to family about this. Like you, yeah. this would be a discussion with, you're married, you have stepkids, mm-hmm. with loved ones around you. Um, what did you say to them about why you were taking this decision, if you're comfortable in saying that? But also, how did they respond to that? Yeah, um, so I want to I want to create the context of that. I have a really big blended family. Everyone has strong personalities and strong opinions, and we've never been shy about sharing them. And what I have to say about this particular experience from the very beginning of my diagnosis is that the most kind and generous thing my family has done is keep their opinions to themselves. Mm. Maybe they share it amongst each other, (laughs) but they have been nothing but supportive and open to what I feel like is my journey. And I've had the space to make these decisions on my own and share them with my family afterwards. Uh, Equally, my husband has always said, this is, you know, I know what I want, but you're the one who's going through this. You're the one who's going through these experiences. And so when I told them that I wanted to stop the chemo and just live my life, knowing what that means, not just for me, but for them as well, everyone has pretty much said, okay, you know, you're the one that's going through it. We support your decision and we're with you and we love you. What are the things that you are doing now Mm -hmm. that give you that life Yeah. um, You know, every morning I get up and I do yoga because it's just so important to be back in my body and to get out of my head first thing in the morning. (laughs) And then right after yoga, I do uh, some meditation and I have been following that routine every day and it just really grounds me and it helps me feel really peaceful. What does mm -hmm. that phrase common sense oncology mean to you, given what Mm -hmm. you're in the middle of right now? I think it's an understanding of my humanity and it allows me the space to engage with my choices with confidence. I don't regret doing, you know, those initial seven rounds of chemo or the, or the surgery. I think it gave me more time and it gave me the ability to dial in to my life again in a way that perhaps I wasn't. And so common sense oncology at this point means that I get to choose. It means sovereignty for me. You get to live on your own terms. Absolutely. Yes. Why did you want to talk about this? This is really, this is mm-hmm. you. This is as personal as it gets. <laughs> yeah. You're just sitting across the table from somebody you've never met before talking yeah. about um, the most personal things. Why, mm-hmm. did, why did you want to do this? I think it's really important that um, I illuminate the experience, not only for people that are going through it, who might be going through it, but also for the people who are around the people going through it, the caregivers, the families, the, the friends, everybody who's affected by this. I mean, yes, it's just happening to me, but it, this experience has a ripple effect on everyone around me. And I feel as though talking about it and being open about it, the good stuff, the bad stuff, hopefully creates space for other people to be honest about what they're feeling and to also maybe feel empowered in their own journey and not be afraid to talk about what they want and what they need for themselves to feel whole after you're put in pieces again and again and again. Is that, do you feel whole now? Do you feel like you're putting yourself back together? I don't know that I'll ever fully put myself back together, but I feel whole again in the sense that all these little pieces of me that were everywhere, that were messy and on the floor and on the walls, (laughs) have sort of come back together, not quite in the shape that they were before, but 
you know, still fragmented, but not broken. And so I see myself as whole now and I feel that. Which is all we could really want, right? That's all we could ask for. That's all we could hope for, yes. I'm really glad to have the chance to talk to you. Um, And I just really, if I were in your position, I don't know that I would have the strength to do a conversation like this. I just (laughs) want to say thank you for for being willing to be open and and talk to us. It's really important. Thank you so much for having me. It's, It's been my pleasure. It's a memory I'm creating. Take care. Thank you. Alicia Mathlin has stage four ovarian cancer and has decided to stop treatment. She was with me in our studio in Toronto. Dr. Christopher Booth is one of the doctors behind this idea of common sense oncology. He's a medical oncologist at the Kingston Health Sciences Center and a professor of oncology at Queen's University. Dr. Booth, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. What are you thinking listening to Alicia Mathlin's experience there? Well, those are very powerful words and you know, a lot of wisdom and lived experience from Alicia. And I think um, you know, she really highlights a lot of the, the key issues that on- oncologists for, for decades have cared very deeply about. And the Common Sense Oncology Initiative is really about bringing these conversations out into the public realm to um, allow patients and their families to understand that there's you know, a range of treatment options and that there's no no uh, specific treatment decision that's going to be right for everyone. What exactly is that? I mean, she used the word sovereignty to describe how how she felt empowered in some ways. What what does common sense oncology look like in practice? Well, I think the Common Sense Oncology Initiative, which was really launched here in Canada, but is a global movement, was uh, you know primarily concerned with with two things, and we believe that we can do better for patients and families with cancer. We recognize that there have been tremendous advances and treatments which transform the lives of patients and offer large benefits. Um, And there is a concern from a health justice point of view that globally, some of those really helpful treatments are not available to everyone depending on where they live. And on the flip side, we are concerned that in recent years, a lot of treatments that are uh, coming down the pipeline Uh, that are usually given in the last year of life offer very small benefits. And these need to be balanced against the lived experience of side effects and the time of patients. And uh, so the Common Sense Oncology group is all about, you know, truly informed decision-making and empowering patients to make the decision that's right for them, especially in the last months of life. You said that the art of providing cancer care in some ways is balancing hope and reality. What were you seeing in your practice that made you reconsider how you approached cancer care? And again, these ideas are not unique to me or anyone kind of uh, within oncology. These are things that oncologists grapple with every day. But it's, um, you know, that one of the trickiest parts of our job is when you meet a patient, and Alicia described it, um, someone who's been newly diagnosed with cancer, and you have a conversation about whether the cancer is curable or not curable. And if it's not curable, there's often a conversation then about how long people can live and what the treatment benefits are. And so that is a very delicate conversation. It's a very emotional conversation, obviously for the patient and family, but also for the oncologist. And so it's constantly um, requiring us to balance uh, the, the ideas of hope and reality. And hope can obviously look um, you know, different for, for different people based on perspectives and where we are in our life journey. But this is, this is specifically for for the end stages of cancer, right? This conversation, but particularly this approach to to what's being called common sense oncology. I mean, there's a major focus on that, but the reality is, is that, you know, treatments along the entire continuum of cancer care are all about balancing the benefits and the side effects and risk. And so the conversation is different when we're talking about treatments that have curative intent, um, but we, we, we tend to focus really on the treatments near the end of life because that tends to be where they have the smallest benefits. And we just think it's important for patients to um, you know, be aware of these things so they can make informed decisions for how they want to spend their remaining time. And again, that idea of patient-centered is something that you think perhaps has been absent in other forms of care. I think the patient's always been the core of cancer care, but mm. the, one of the challenges, and, and you, you mentioned in your introductory comments, is the public perception of cancer is a battle and the war on cancer. And so there's this concept of continuous treatment, continuous um, fighting a battle. And so the Common Sense Oncology Initiative is really about, mm. as Alicia so eloquently said, you know, changing the narrative around that and being willing to have hard and honest conversations within our community as well as with the public about the realities of cancer care. How common is it that a patient would only get marginal benefits from what is 
we describe this as brutal, and, and, and Alicia described it as in, in the same terms. What would be kind of brutal cancer treatment? How often is it that they would, that would only lead to kind of marginal benefits? Um, Matt, I think it's, I mean, important to emphasize that there's a huge range of both treatment benefits as well as the side effect profile. And so I certainly don't want to give the impression that, you know, all of our treatments have small benefits and, and brutal side effects, although there are some that probably fall into that category. So we have, you know, I, I conceptualize three buckets of cancer treatments. The first bucket are transformative treatments that cure people or help them live for many extra months or years. The second bucket is the more modest benefits, but still help people probably live, you know, for many extra months. The third bucket is the one that's deeply problematic. And unfortunately, a lot of the new cancer medicines fall in this third bucket, which is very small benefits, perhaps not even helping someone live longer, um, but they come along with side effects. And obviously, that becomes a deeply personal decision about how people want to balance perhaps Perhaps small gains in in time, or perhaps not even any real gain in time, um, against the side effects and downsides of treatment. How much of this is new? Because my assumption is that doctors have always weighed the benefits of a treatment against the the side effects and the quality of life. You're, you're absolutely right. So this concept of you know patient centered care and having honest discussions about treatment benefits and side effects is not new. It's age old. Um, the reason that we launched this initiative was we were worried that the narrative had shifted in the public space. And some of this has to do with hype that comes out of um, our field, but also through the media, that every new cancer treatment is a breakthrough or a game changer. And we were worried that this was fueling um, decision-making by some patients that might actually not be in keeping with what they really want. And so this is about, you know, allowing space for these difficult conversations uh, to happen so that our field can be recalibrated back to what really matters, which is helping people with cancer live longer and better lives. I mean, there is the possibility that the treatments may work. How do you factor that in to that decision-making process in those conversations, those difficult conversations? You don't, you don't, there's the possibility that you don't know what may happen, for example. Correct. So every um, individual patient is unique and their experience will be unique. Um, but just to give you, you know, I guess a pragmatic example, um, you know, our research group and others have shown in the last number of years, the majority of new cancer medicines that are included in guidelines and recommended worldwide, um, when they're tested in clinical trials, they don't actually help people live longer. What they do is they control tumor growth on a CAT scan for a period of months. And in many circumstances, that does not necessarily translate into someone feeling better or living longer. So there's um, this challenge with some of these endpoints that our field has become increasingly focused on the science and the molecular pathways of cancer and shrinking tumors. But this is maybe taking a step back and recognizing that we treat people with cancer, not just tumors. What role does the pharmaceutical industry play? in what treatment is currently being offered to patients. Part of this is about the hype that you mentioned and the stories, I mean, guilty as charged that we will end up talking about saying there's a breakthrough treatment. And you'll often hear about that through a news release, through news coverage that may have been prompted by information provided by those pharmaceutical companies. Matt, this is one of the elephants in the room. So, I mean, I think it's worth uh, highlighting that a lot of our really, really good treatments and some of our best clinical trials come from partnerships with the pharmaceutical industry. So I don't mean to suggest that they should not be involved in any of these big decisions. The problem is, is they now control the research ecosystem. More than 90% of cancer drug clinical trials are funded by pharma. Um, oncology has become uh, an incredibly lucrative space for the pharmaceutical industry. And, um, you know, the, the, the alignments of the incentives for the pharmaceutical industry are obviously different from the incentives and the goals of care providers, patients, and families. And so sometimes there's a disconnect there. And so there is a lot of money uh, in the system. And sometimes I think that does drive uh, the system uh, perhaps away from what really matters. What sort of debate is there within medical communities about what is being framed as this common sense approach to oncology? I could imagine, I mean, for any number of doctors, there are any number of opinions. How, how vigorous is that debate? I mean, I think all, all oncologists go into this field um, because we care deeply about people with cancer and we want to help them live longer and better lives. I don't think there's any debate about the core values of the Common Sense Oncology Initiative. I think, um, you know, this is not an, an, an initiative that's about reducing treatment options. This is really about empowering patients to make informed decisions. It's about recalibrating the cancer research ecosystem. So we run clinical trials to identify treatments that have significant benefits for our patients. 
rather than perhaps small benefits with a lot of side effects. Um, and certainly, you know, this is not about, you know, an, an anti-pharmaceutical industry initiative, right? We recognize that pharma is a really important partner in this, but it should be centered around the needs of patients and their families rather than centered around the needs of the pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Booth, let me just bring one more guest into this conversation. Dr. Camilla Zimmerman is the head and Liederman chair of the Department of Supportive Care at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, the University Health Network in Toronto. Dr. Zimmerman, good morning to you. Good morning. What are your thoughts on, on what we just heard from Dr. Booth, this shift that he's calling for, what's being framed as, as common sense oncology? What do you make of that? Well, I, I do think it, it makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, and what we what we do in palliative care is is really right along those lines, uh, prioritizing quality of life over um, quantity of life that's that that doesn't have any quality. So, and and actually, even when you're when you're um, lengthening uh, the duration of life quality is still obviously extremely important, and that's what we're doing in palliative care. You write about the importance of changing the reputation in some ways of palliative care. What do we get wrong about palliative care? What is it and what isn't it? Well, I think most um, patients and also their families and the public in general think of palliative care as very much associated with death and dying. And we actually interviewed 71 patients and caregivers with advanced cancer and ask them about their perceptions of palliative care. And uh, we had very consistent themes. So one was death and dying, uh, that there's no real meaning, someone said, besides death even. Uh, the other is hopelessness, that really nothing else can be done that you're giving up uh, if you're getting palliative care. Um, dependency to the point of being bedridden and just waiting to die inpatient care in places that you can never get out of again, uh, comfort care, but comfort care as in just keeping people comfortable until they die. And then some people just really have no understanding or no conception at all of what palliative care is. It's just sort of a black, scary box to them. Um, and this is something we're really trying to change um, and uh, really make it public that palliative care is, is not just about death and dying. It's really about life and living and living that life with the greatest quality of life possible. Given that you described it as a black box, do you end up um, with a bit of a binary in, in the minds of patients and their loved ones that you either pursue aggressive care or you yes. get palliative care? Very much. And it, it doesn't have to be a choice in either or. What we're, we've been pushing really for the past decade or two in palliative care is uh, integrating palliative care into oncology. So bringing palliative care and bringing the uh, palliative care team in early in the diagnosis of any illness that is life-threatening. That, can, so be, that can be really scary though, because again, given those preconceptions, people think as soon as the palliative care team is there, that, 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 that the end is in sight. Yes, and, and what, I've, what I've called that is really confusing the umbrella and the rain. So the uh, the umbrella is associated with the rain because uh, you often need an umbrella in the case of rain. It's the same thing with palliative care. You often need palliative care when you're at the end of life, um, but that doesn't mean that uh, palliative care necessarily always has to uh, come at the end of life. You might want to bring a, an umbrella along just in case, in other words. Um, so really what we're about is improving palliative, improving sy symptoms, um, pain, nausea, shortness of breath, emotional support, um, practical support, and helping with those decisions that Alicia was talking about. I mean, she was very clear about what she wanted um, for her life, but for many people, it's, it, it's a confusing decision whether to continue treatment or not. Because they don't want to die. Because they don't want to die, exactly. Um, but as Dr. Booth was saying, sometimes it's not a question of, you know, giving up treatment means that you're uh, choosing to die, but it's just the cancer, unfortunately, that is not treatable. So then you have to make some decisions about how do I want to live the rest of my life? And if you ask someone, you know, you have six months to live, what would you like to do with those six months? Most people would not choose to feel really ill and to be mostly traveling back and forth between the cancer center and home. Um, they would choose to spend time with their families and do something meaningful. 
Dr. Booth mentioned the idea of the language that we use to talk about cancer. And you will hear this, it, it, it's, I mean, you'll often read it in an obituary that somebody had a fight against cancer. They lost their fight against cancer. But you'll also hear it in those fundraising campaigns for various charities that this is, um, you know, part of the battle against cancer. We're involved in the fight against cancer. What's wrong with that language, Dr. Zimmerman? So... I personally, so so people have spoken very much up against that. I personally think that we can reframe that as fighting cancer is also fighting the symptoms of cancer, fighting the pain, uh, fighting um, the distress, uh, and sort of harness that that so-called fight. Um, because many people say that they don't want to give up fighting, and palliative care is not giving up fighting. It's fighting a different kind of uh, fight. Um, and when cancer really is not curable, sometimes there's, you know, nothing that you can do in terms of cancer treatment, but we can always uh, help improve quality of life. But what you'll often hear from people is that w when their loved one dies, they don't, want to, they don't want that fight to seem as though it was lost because that, there can be a negative connotation to that because of, of the language that's used. Yeah, so that's why we're fighting a different kind of fight. Um, it's it's really uh, misdirected to, I think, fight a cancer that inherently uh, we don't have treatments for. And then at that point, when you're taking more cancer treatments, then you do experience what Alicia d did in terms of all the suffering that comes with the treatments without the benefit of the treatment. It's one thing if that treatment's going to cure you, but really if that treatment offers nothing in terms of lifelong life and as a so-called uh, fight that is only the the uh, trauma and injuries associated with the fight and, and not the prolonged life. I think people, um, I think no one would want to do that, um, but people have the misconception that taking any taking cancer treatment is, is always going to offer some hope mm. or uh, of reasonable hope of cure. Dr. Booth, uh, Dr. Booth, Booth, not Dr. Booth what do we need to think about when it comes to that language? How, how, what, what's a better way of reframing the language from your perspective? Um, I mean, I, I don't have an easy answer to that, but I think, um, you know, as Dr. Zimmerman mentioned, it's, you know, finding hope and joy and meaning in, in, in life. Um, I mean, for all of us, right. Eventually all of us at one point will, will be patients of the health system. And I think at the end of the day, I think all of us would hope that any medical treatment that we're offered will help us live either a longer life or a better life or ideally both. And so I think that, you know, recalibrating um, the conversations around cancer to focus on those two things and allowing the space to recognize that every patient will have a different emphasis on how they want to spend that time, whether it's on more treatment versus less treatment, how much side effects they're willing to tolerate and also what their own individual journey will be like. This is a, an approach that I think, Dr. Booth, a lot of people will find hard to wrap their heads around. Less treatment in some ways is counterintuitive. How confident are you that something like this can gain traction? Well, I think it's not so much about less treatment. It's just about really truly informing patients and families about what the treatment can offer and what but, it cannot. But it is. And I mean, it, 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 it ultimately, it's about deciding that that, as we've said, I mean, in those last six months, perhaps that kind of treatment isn't isn't necessary. And that, that to people, I think, is well, we're stopping something. You're right. It, it is. This is a very, very uh, different narrative from what we've had for the last number of decades in the public space. And so this initiative really is about starting those conversations, recognizing this is a paradigm shift. And um, I think a lot of people, uh, if, you know, as Dr. Zimmerman said, if we have six months left to live and we're offered a medicine that will not help us live any longer, will require us to spend one or two days every week or two at the chemotherapy unit and will make us sick, I think, um, you know, a lot of people will say perhaps that's not for me. Some people will choose to have that. And, and I think we have to respect everyone has different ideas about this. But I think that it's, uh, it's really about starting a conversation in this space. And if we don't, what's at stake, do you think? Well, I think, um, you know, what we don't want to do is have patients and families look back and wonder if their last number of weeks or months of life could have been more comfortable and could have allowed them to 
um, live and, and do the things that they want to do. And for some people that might involve, you know, weekly or biweekly trips to the cancer center for treatment, but for other people, it might be traveling, uh, spending more time with loved ones or pursuing the hobbies and interests they have. Dr. Zimmerman, how do we need to rethink this just finally? I mean, what, what should we be thinking differently about beyond the language when it comes to how we think about, I remember there was a, a book, um, years ago, cancer is a word, not a sentence. Um, and it was meant to kind of take people out of, you know, this idea that it's more than just a word, that it, that, that it, it, it's, that we're focusing on something specific here. If you're talking about cancer, how do we need to think differently about it, given what we've been discussing? I think cancer is a journey. So, and at different times in the journey, different things are appropriate. And palliative care can be seen as uh, a team that accompanies you on, on that journey together with the oncology team. And we can involve palliative care really right from the diagnosis of a disease um, that is life-threatening. And we can work together uh, with the oncologists uh, to accompany patients and their families uh, through the course of that journey. This is important to talk about. I'm glad to speak with you both about it. I think there are a lot of people who will hear themselves in Alicia's story, but also hear themselves in, in the work that you're both putting forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Dr. Christopher Booth is an oncologist at the Kingston Health Sciences Center, professor of oncology at Queen's University. Dr. Camilla Zimmerman is head and leaderman chair of the Department of Supportive Care at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center at the University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, would love to hear from you on this because I'm betting that Alicia's story is not an unfamiliar one to many people. Um, what do you make of that idea of what's being called a common sense approach to oncology? But also, do you know somebody, perhaps you're in, this is in your own life, where stopping treatment was the right decision? Or perhaps, um, as Dr. Zimmerman uh, suggested, that after a loved one has died, you, you wonder about those last six months and you wonder whether the treatment that they went through was the right decision and you wonder whether perhaps it would have been better to have stopped that treatment. Um, it's a tricky conversation, but really important and, and f difficult uh, to address, but that's kind of at the heart of, of why we wanted to have this conversation. Tell us your thoughts. You can email us, thecurrent at cbc.ca, or you can record a voice memo on your phone and then send it to that email address, thecurrent at cbc.ca.